Okay, so um, let me quickly summarize. I should have drawn this picture actually when we were doing the map. I think it made things easier. But anyway. Um, water over the dam. All right, so um, let me see. I want to, um, we took two coupled guys and we wrote down a set of equations, okay? And the equations are theta one dot equals H one of theta two minus theta one and theta two dot equals H two of theta one minus theta two. And you remember that H sub J of phi is 1 over t, 0 to t, z of t dot g of g. That's an important thing. <laughs> so if we have many guys, there'll be commas here. But in neurons, let me, let me um, talk a little bit about neurons. So suppose I have a bunch of neurons. Say they're Hodgkin Huxley, so they have this complicated form, okay, and then plus coupling, so on, times sum of j or k, g, j, k, let me put a minus, I'll just put it this way, g, j, k of s sub k of t, and now I'll write e sin minus v, j, okay? So I flip this around because I want to put the minus sign there. Okay? Everybody see that? I'm going to assume that they're all the same reversal potential, so it's all excitatory neurons or all inhibitory neurons, okay? And we have equations for all these guys too. Okay? So you'll notice that the but the thing is, the n sub j dt equals g n of n sub j, v sub j, and so on. These, there's no coupling through these guys. Coupling is only through the voltage, right? Because that's where the synapses come in. So in that case, if we assume that in absence of coupling, v j of t equals v tilde of t is a oscillator, then this is where epsilon equals zero, then Vj of t with coupling is equal to V tilde of t plus theta j. Okay. Oh, let me do one more thing. I'm going to add this to it. Okay. I'm going to drive them with some weak heterogeneity. So I'm going to drive them with, I'm going to allow the neurons to have slightly different currents. Do you see that? I'm just adding that, okay? So let's apply this theory to, um, to neural oscillators, all right? So from this, we, we have the, the shape of the voltage, all right? And we also have S sub J of T. We'll assume all the synapses have the same shape, okay? But they're just shifted. Okay? So they're shifted by, they have some particular shape. Now, one of the things you might do is change the shape of the synapses. Maybe change the time constant of the synapse, change the reversal potential of the synapse. There's all kinds of games you can play like that, okay? Because it affects how things are. 
For example, in certain kinds of neural models, like the class one excitable ones, the so SNCC, if you couple them with fast excitatory synapses, they're always out of phase with each other. Or maybe it's slow. Um, they, synchrony is much better if, with in, inhibition if the synapses are fast. Okay? So everything cool here, I'm just plugging things. And so let's figure out what the equations for each phase are for the neural thing, all right? Well, we'll apply, oh, and we also have, we have the phase resetting curve for the neural, because that's something we can experimentally determine, right? We drive that neuron, so it's an oscillator, and then we give it perturbations, and we can compute that, because that's the only one we really can compute. We can't really do the infinitesimal phase resetting curve for the end variable or anything, because we can't really manipulate that. That's at the channel level, but we can manipulate the voltage, okay? Oh, and I should really, um, for those of you who are physicists and care about dimensions, um, there should be a CM here <laughs> that I threw, right? <laughs> because there really is a CDVDT here, okay? So this is capacitance. So, it's actually very useful to think about when, when I'm finished here, when I'm finished writing down the equations, um, to figure out what the dimensions of these H functions are, okay? Dimensions in the sense of what units they have. So before I go on, what do you think the um, PRC has? What are the dimensions of the PRC? What do you think they are? Okay, remember, what is the normalization that we have? We have the z of t times the derivative of the limit cycle, or dot, has to be one. So that means component-wise, each of, because you're gonna add them all up to take the dot prime. Component-wise, everything has to have no dimensions. So what's the derivative of the volt with respect to t? That's millivolts per millisecond. So the PRC is milliseconds per millivolts. It's telling you if I shifted the voltage by a certain amount, that will shift the phase by a certain amount of time. Does that make sense? So milliseconds per millivolt is what the PRC is in the Z direction, or in the V direction, okay? All right, so. Let's go through the theory, then d theta j d tau will be equal to omega j, I'll tell you what omega j is in just a second, plus sum k g j k H of, okay, I'm drawing a little H, okay, and let me define everything, okay. Omega J is 1 over T, 0 to T, um, what, what did I call, oh, let me call the add, let me call the PRC, the voltage PRC, capital delta of T, okay? That's the voltage PRC, perturbing the voltage. Now you might say, well wait, he said millivolts per millisecond, but you're perturbing a current. But remember, you have to divide through by CM, and that current is actually shifting the voltage, okay? Delta of T. There's that reversal part. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I was doing the H. <laughs> All, right. All it is is the average of the PRC. So for example, if the PRC is a sign, <laughs> then this doesn't do anything, okay? But most neurons, the, the PRC doesn't have a zero average. So this is kind of very convenient because, oh, divided by CM, right? Because remember, everything's divided by CM. So let's check the dimensions and make sure they're right, okay? What dimensions should omega j have? Phase has dimensions of time, because you're adding it to time. This is dimensions of time, so omega j better be dimensionless. Well, ij over cm, current divided by capacitance, has dimensions of volts per, millis volts per second, right? You remember any of your... <laughs> Um, somewhere around there, you probably remember that. And this is seconds per volt. <laughs> so this is dimensionless. And this is the integral t divided by t. So great. It's, it's dimensionless. That's great. Isn't it great when the dimensions, that's a way to tell if you kind of got the thing right. Okay? So omega j is dimensionless. I mean, you think of it as a frequency, but it's just how fast this guy goes, because phase is time and tau is time. Sometimes you might divide this phase by the period and then it becomes dimensionless and then this becomes a frequency, one over d. <laughs> what about h? h of phi is one over t, zero to t of delta of t, E sin minus V tilde of T, S tilde of T plus phi dt. Oh, divided by um, Cm. <laughs> okay. Now, H is not dimensionless because we have this stupid conductance in front of it. But GH will be dimensionless. And why won't it be dimensionless? If we put the G in here, this becomes G times this, that's a current, divided by <laughs> capacitance is our volts per millisecond, and then milliseconds per volt. Synaptic thing is dimensionless, right? It's just the probability of the synapse being, it's like a gating variable, it has no dimensions, okay? So you have to think of this as amount per conductance. So there's our general network of weakly coupled neural oscillators. And that's completely general. It'll work for any kind of coupling. I should point out that the G's should always be non-zero, or non-negative, non-negative because they're conductances. Okay. So there you go, all right? So in general, neural guys are just sums. But in more general scenarios, there might be more complicated interactions. Everybody see? OK. So now, you know, for example, if you do predator prey, I think, are you guys doing any of that next week? or? People doing ecology models, when's that? Next. Next week, if you've got patchy environments with some species in here, okay, and these species have different migration rates, then, and and in absence of this, these guys, each patch oscillates, and they oscillate at the same frequency, maybe just slightly different ones, then the same theory will hold, and you'll get an equation for phase for each one of these. So basically, for every neuron, hodgkin Huxley neuron you've hooked up, you get a different phase.
Now, I think it'll be very useful if Prani computes some of these H functions for you uh, with some of these models. Hodgkin Huxley produces very nice looking H functions. Um, anyway, all right. Let me, before I go on, let me do a little bit of general stuff here. Let's suppose we have d theta j dt equals h sub j of theta 1 minus theta j theta 2. This is very general. Okay. So suppose we have this, all right? Definition. The eraser go. All right. A phase locked. Okay, so, and all the other size of j's constant. Okay, now, why can I make psi 1 0 without loss of generality? You'll notice that every one of these guys just depends on the difference, okay? So that's really all that matters. So without loss of generality, I could just subtract an arbitrary constant from everybody, <laughs> okay? And it won't change anything. So how do we find the phase lock solution? Well, we have to solve this. <laughs> so we have omega equals h1 of theta 1. This is 0, because theta 1 minus theta 1 is 0, comma psi 2 psi n. That's j equals 1. <laughs> j equals 2 h2 of minus psi 2, right? Theta 1 minus theta 2 is, since theta 1 is 0, it's psi. Oh, notice that the omega t's all cancel here, right? Omega t minus omega t. Oh, here, I'll just write it. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah. All the way down for N. So that's one, two, n equations in two, n minus one plus one unknown. There we go. So you see, we have, so that, that counts right. <laughs> so one generically expects only a countable number 
such solutions. Does that make sense? Okay. So once we have a solution, the solution, we've reduced finding the behavior of this huge network of coupled oscillators to solutions to some algebraic problems. Now these are hard algebraic problems in general, and it's not even clear whether a solution exists in general. However, if there does exist a solution, what's the next thing we usually ask? What do we usually want to know about a solution if we found one? Is the solution unique? Huh? Is the solution unique or there? Did you say stability? No. Oh, dang. So what do we, oh. <laughs> okay. We want to know whether it's stable, right? <laughs> or later on, when there's some parameters, we might want to know how we lose that solution or something. But the first thing we want to know is if it's stable. Okay, so here's a theorem. Let omega zero psi two psi n be a phase lock solution okay let a j k let this a j k be okay if a j k greater than or equal to zero, then the solution, oh, are two conditions. AJK greater than zero. All right, now I'm gonna have a little graph theory, okay? We have a matrix, an n by n matrix, AJK, all right? So I want you to regard that as n nodes, okay? end nodes, and I'm going to draw a directed edge from node K to node J if AJK is non-zero. If AJK is zero, I don't want to draw that, okay? So if AJK is greater than zero and the graph is, so now I want to say the graph is complete if I can get from any node to any other node following those um, edges. Then the phase lock solution is asymptotically stable. That's a sufficient condition, but not necessary, okay? But it's really easy to check, because <laughs> all you have to do is, once you find the phase lock solution, is look at the derivative of the functions in the links, okay? But this is a sufficient condition, but not necessary, okay? Do you understand the difference between necessity and sufficiency? Okay. So let's do some examples of networks. Now we're finally into networks. Okay. Let me do first a network of two. All right. Suppose the oscillators are identical and they're coupled identically, but they have slight differences in frequency. 
So I have d theta 1 dt equals omega plus g h. g is the strength of the coupling. So we're back to our friend's neurons. Now remember, what we know about H, it's a periodic function, right? With period T, so it's like sines and cosines, right? Infinite series of sines and cosines, you know that, right? So if we subtract these two, we get d phi dt. Well, let's, let's, let's try, let's think about things in terms of our phase lock solution before we do that, okay? So that means we have omega, equals omega 1 plus g h of psi 2 and omega equals omega 2 plus g h of minus psi 2, right? Using that definition. Remember, there's the definition. Psi 1 is 0. Side two. All right. So let's subtract these two. All right. That's the best way to get rid of this sucker. We don't want that sucker in there. And we get omega two minus omega one plus g h of minus side two minus h of side two. Okay. What is this? That's just minus twice the odd part of H. Okay? Right? Because the odd part of a function, remember, is F of X minus F of minus X over 2. That's the odd part of a function. So this is just twice the odd part of H. Okay? And that's an odd periodic function. So let me write this is zero, zero equals little delta, that's what I'll call this difference in frequency, minus two g h odd of psi two, okay? Right? Everybody see that? Now, let's suppose there's no frequency difference, so delta is zero. So we need to find the roots. Zero equals minus two g h odd of psi two. What do we know about periodic, odd periodic functions? Are there any zeros to them? I claim there's at least two zeros. Certainly, zero is a fixed point, right? Because this is an odd function, right? Odd function, h odd of zero is zero, right? So there's always a zero, but I also claim, remember, a continuous periodic function, okay? It's odd, so it does something here. Okay, and it does, has to do the opposite there. And then out here at two pi, it has to be back to like this, right? And it's odd, so it's gotta have another guy in the middle. And that other guy in the middle is exactly at pi, half a cycle, right? Because h odd of t over 2 is h odd of t over 2 plus t, because minus t, because it's periodic, right? And that's equal to h odd of minus t over 2, right? Right? Because that's just what that is. And because it's odd, that's equal to minus h odd 
of t over 2. So h odd of t over 2 is minus h odd of t over 2. That's only possible if h odd of t over 2 is 0. Right? So when delta is 0, there's at least two fixed points. One, both oscillators going together. And the other one, oscillators going out of phase. So by symmetry, whenever there's two guys that are the same coupled together, there's always going to be the synchronous manifold and the out of phase manifold for these oscillators. And then it's just a question of looking at their derivative to determine whether they're synchronous. So once you've solved this thing for psi 2, then you plug it into here. That gives you capital omega. You see? Everybody see that? This is independent of omega, so we can solve for it. Now, now we'll turn the frequency difference on. H odd is bounded. It's a continuous periodic function, so it has a bound, right? So if G, if delta over G is too big, we can't solve the solution. We can't find the solution. So if the frequency differences get too big, in other words, if delta over G is bigger than the maximum of this, or the minimum, then there's no roots to this. And what happens? These two oscillators, they just drift apart. They never synchronize. And there's no synchronous, there's no phase lock solution. So if, if little delta is zero, there's always a phase lock solution. Now, it could be, there's always synchrony and antiphase. And they may or may not be stable. You could have them both be unstable, and there could be another guy in there. For example, sine of 2 theta or something like that. Zero and, two, uh, zero and pi are unstable, but pi over 2 is a stable solution. Yeah. All right, so that's n equals 2. Do you have any questions so far? No questions? Good. All right. So let's, let's move on to, I want to do one of my favorite examples. I'm going to leave it as a homework problem to you because it's a really cool example. All right. Four oscillators. Okay. And they're coupled through nearest neighbor. OK? So this guy only talks to this guy and this guy. All right? This guy talks to four guys. So it's north, south, east, west. You're really talking to your nearest neighbor. So let's write down the equations. D theta sub j dt equals, here I've gotten rid of the tau, okay, I hope you don't mind. Uh, we have a saying in, in the US when, for giving up, the tau, so it's a joke. It comes from boxing, okay, like we were fighting, right? So, so. I'm throwing in the tau, it means I'm, okay, here's my equation. One, or no, zero, okay, just, there's no difference. Sum k in n of j, sine theta k minus theta j, okay? So this is a four by four array, all right? And this, each guy, N of J is the four coupled to, okay, in your network. So this guy is coupled to only two. 
whereas this guy is coupled to four, this guy's coupled to three. Okay, everybody understand that, okay? Claim phase lock solution looks like this. Zero, zero, pi over two, pi over two, three pi over two, three pi over two, pi, pi. Oh, one phase lock solution to this is synchrony. Everybody's equal, right, clearly. Oh, and before we go on, is synchrony stable? Well the derivative of sine, cosine, evaluated at zero, is one. So certainly it satisfies this, okay? And the graph is certainly connected. So synchrony is an asymptotically stable state, okay? Oh, maybe I should say a little bit about the proof of this, okay, before I go on, okay? The proof of this, you linearize this equation, all right? And you'll get something that has a whole lot of negative stuff on the di diagonal because the derivative of this guy with respect to theta, the derivative of this guy with respect to um, theta 1 is um, minus, 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 minus A21, minus, minus A12, minus A22, minus A, um, I mean A, minus A12, minus A13, minus A14, and so on, right? It's got a lot of stuff on the diagonal, and then stuff off the diagonal. And it turns out you can prove this using something called, uh, this is my list of top five theorems, the Gersh-Gorin circle theorem, okay? The great theorem. And I use it to prove this theorem. Basically, it says that um, if you have a matrix A, okay, it says this. Let DJ equal This defines a disk in the complex plane, okay? Centered at the diagonal. Yeah, yeah, okay? And its radius is by all the guys off the diagonal. Then the eigenvalues lie in the union of these disks, okay? Isn't that cool? It's a great theorem. I love it. Okay. So anyway, back to this. Okay. I claim, I claim that there's a solution to this equation, a phase lock solution, that has this form. And C is between 0 and pi over 2. Okay. Yes? Um, could you tell what the A, G, G, number like that? What the what? The uh, A? 
Where A? AJK? It's the derivative of 8. What? Are they, okay, are they gonna, um, they're gonna be numerical values, are they? Sorry, the what? The AJKs, are they gonna be numerical values? The AJK here, in this theorem? No, in that one. In this. They're the derivatives of this function. With respect to the phi yeah. With respect to AJK. So this is A15 is the derivative of this guy with respect to the fifth entry in this matrix okay. evaluated at the phase lock solution. Uh, will, uh, they, like, will they be binary numbers? Huh? It's not going to be binary numbers, right? It's not going to be binary numbers, he's asking. No, 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 they're continuous numbers. They're, they're non, there, there could be zero, they could be 0 0.8, they could be 64, it could be minus 17. So They're just, um, how are we going to uh, get the matrix for the graph? How oh, oh, the graph, the graph is if AJK is non-zero, we'll draw a link. That's all. So then we'll take, if AJK, okay. So how do I get a graph? I see, okay. So the AJK are continuous, they're any number, okay? They could be any number, okay? If they're not, if let's suppose that they're non-negative, okay? Because if they are, that violates this part, okay? So let's suppose they're non-negative. So they're either zero or positive. If they're positive, then you draw a link from node K to node J, okay? If AJK is greater than zero, draw a link. If it's not greater than zero, don't draw the link. Okay? So, I claim that this is a solution to this equation. And your homework problem, your homework assignment is to find C. Okay? And prove, using this theorem, it's asymptotically stable. Okay? So you'll draw the graph and show that it's connected and you can get anywhere. So you just have to find this C and verify that this is in fact satisfies zero equals this. Okay? Oh, incidentally, in this case, omega is zero. Okay? And the way you can see that is sum this up over all ends, but all the signs cancel. Okay? Cool, huh? All right, let's do some more examples of other topologies. Oh, why is this cool? Why is this cool? What is this? This is a rotating wave, right? This is like a wave that spins, just a rotating wave. Do you see that? Because they're all locked. This, if you go around here, you cover one full cycle. And my first PhD student proved the general case of this in a 2n by 2n array, proved that there existed solutions like th of this form, okay? And then another PhD student um, proved a slight generalization of it. Oh, the, but the one thing is you don't need it to be signed. It could be any odd periodic function. So it's really fun to, to put these networks up on the computer. They make really pretty pictures, okay? These nearest neighbor networks, especially if you add a cosine term to this. Then none of the theorems work, but, well, they, the theorems still work, but, but we can't write down an explicit solution. So I want to do some other examples. Let's consider a ring of nearest neighbor coupled oscillators, okay? So, theta sub j dot equals h 
I'll make the coupling the same for all the forward guys and the same for all the backward guys, but not necessarily the same for both, okay? So H sub A of theta J plus one minus theta J plus H sub D of theta J minus one minus theta J. J equals one to N with theta N plus one identified as theta one and theta minus one identified as theta N. So this is a ring of guys like this, all right? And so on, right? With coupling one direction and coupling the other direction, okay? Everybody understand the situation, okay? So one solution to this is synchrony, right? Synchronous solution satisfies omega equals H A of zero plus H D zero. See that? Just plug in all the thetas are the same, and each one of these equations is the same, and that gives us the synchronous solution. Okay? But I claim that there's another family of solution. Claim theta sub j equals 2 pi m j minus 1 over n. Claim that that's a solution. Now, before, oh, plus omega mt. I forgot that part. Okay. I claim that that's a phase lock solution. Before we plug that in and figure out if indeed it is, let's interpret what this is. Okay? Well, when m equals zero, that's the secret of solution we just looked at, right? When m equals one, what is this? It's a traveling wave that goes around that ring, right? Because when m equals one, theta one is zero, theta two is two pi over n, theta three is four pi over n, so each guy gets up, and then by the time you get to n minus one, it's who n minus one pi over n, which is the same as minus two pi over n. So you see that? That's a traveling wave. Let's plug that in and check. Plug it in. If it's true, we must have omega m equals h a of theta j plus one minus theta j. That's equal to well, there you go. So that is independent of j, so we're good, right? Now, if H A is an, if H A equals H D, and they're both odd functions, then these cancel and omega M is zero. Boring. 
But if these include some even, they're different, or they include some non-odd parts, then omega m depends on m. Okay. How, how many of you guys have ever heard of dispersion relations? All right. Dispersion relations have to do with traveling waves, and it gives you the frequency against the, the wave number, right? Well, this is exactly that. This is the frequency of the wave, and m is the wave number. So if m equals 0, it's the synchronous. m equals 1 means there's one wave around the ring. m equals 2 means there's two waves in there. m equals 3. See? This is just like you guys already know, physics. All right, so how do we determine stability? Okay. We want to figure out the stability of these. Okay. Well, we can apply our theorem. Let's be a little, we can be more precise. Okay. This is kind of nice because it's near the neighbor. Okay, so let's linearize around here. All right, that's what we always do. And we get D um, phi sub J dt equals H A prime of 2 pi M over N times phi J plus 1 minus phi J plus H D prime of two minus two pi over m n of phi j minus one minus phi j right everybody see that that's the theorized equation <clears throat> now this matrix has special form okay it is a special kind of matrix it's called a circulant matrix let me explain what a circulant means. Let, let's let's kind of look at, let me call this number A, and let's call this number B. <laughs> so let's draw what this matrix looks like. Okay? J equals 1, it's minus A plus D, A zero, zero D, right? You see that? I think I did it, right? Yeah, yeah, J equals 1, it's A phi 2 minus A phi 1. And this is d phi n, remember that rule. All right. What's the next guy? It's minus a plus d, a, zero, zero, d, right? What's the next guy? Zero, d, minus a plus d, a, Zero, zero. So what's going on here is at each step, all we're doing is shifting everything over. You see? Until we get to the bottom. A, zero, D, minus A, minus D, right? Everybody see that? That's... So here's a great little result. Have you guys ever heard of convolutions? Huh? And if you have a convolution in periodic functions, then remember the Fourier transform of the convolution is the Fourier transform of the guy you're con times the other guy, right? 
So Fourier stuff is great because convolutions kind of preserve it. If you can involve a periodic function with sine 5x, you get back sine 5x times something, right? Multiply it by cosine 10x, you get cosine 10x plus something. That's the beauty of convolutions. So this is like a discrete convolution. So let's do a, let me do a generalization of this. Let's consider a matrix that has the form alpha 1, alpha 2. Uh, it might be easier if I write it. Alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha n minus 1. Then shift everything. Alpha n minus 1, alpha 0, alpha 1. Okay, all the way down here to alpha zero, alpha n minus one, alpha one, alpha two, okay? See that? I claim that I can write down the exact eigenvalues of this, okay? Here they are. So this, we want to solve this equation. We want to solve a x equals lambda x, right? Find the eigenvalues, right? How many do we need? We need n of them, right? N-dimensional matrix, right? That's fundamental theorem of algebra, right? Because you get characteristic polynomial has n roots, right? Some of them might be double or not, okay? Let C sub, let C sub M equal E to the I, 2 pi I M over N, okay? Right? That is an nth root of unity, okay? This to the n power gives us one, right? And rather than, uh, since I've labeled things here, rather than going from one to n, I'm gonna go from zero to n minus one. So I wanna solve x sub zero, x n minus one, equals lambda x0 xn minus 1. Okay? I just relabeled the indices. Here's why I labeled it like that. How many of you guys program in Fortran? How many of you program in Python? How many of you program in C? What's the first number in an array in Python and C? Zero, right? In Fortran and MATLAB, one, right? Well, see, I don't like, I never used MATLAB, and I used Fortran when I was a baby, but, uh, I mean, when I was a little kid, but I always learned, I learned C, and then my grad students, they like Python, Python's more C-like, it's got the zero as the index. So that's why I started this, because I don't like starting with one. I know that really one is the first, and zero is, ah, oh, man. I was like those people like Janet Jackson, they have those, you know, they don't have to walk around with this thing. <laughs> Okay, so here's my claim. I claim that if I let x0, xn minus 1, or let x sub k equal cm to the k power, that will give me my eigenvectors, and I'll find my eigenvalues. 
I'll let you guys show that, but it's pretty straightforward to do. You just write all this out. But the beauty of it is that we now see that lambda m is just sum j equals 0 to n minus 1 alpha sub j c sub m to the j. So you get the eigenvalues right like that. Okay? I'll let you show that that's the case. So that's the beauty of a circulate matrix. You can write down the eigenvalues exactly. So we can apply that to this and figure out the stability. Turns out you just need this to be positive. Well, it, it, you know, there's, there's possibilities. For, certainly if this and this are positive, then it's stable because of my other theorem. But in general, you, you can go ahead and plug this in and get the exact expression for the eigenvalues. So here's what's interesting, is that h, remember, is a periodic function. So let me draw h. Maybe it looks like that, OK? Periodic function. Doesn't have to be h of 0 is 0. Okay? Looks like that, OK? And we'll look at the. And suppose m equals 0, OK? Then we have h a prime of 0 and h d prime of 0, OK? They're just some numbers. So if suppose h a, and you can see suppose, from my picture of h here that h a prime is positive, of 0 is positive. So from our synchrony theorem, synchrony is stable. Or from our general theorem, synchrony is stable. So synchrony is stable in the case m equals 0. But now look what happens. For, so let's suppose m equals 1, OK? Then we have h a prime of 2 pi over n and h d prime of minus 2 pi over n, OK? Well, if n is really big, then these guys are close to 0. And if h a prime of 0 and h d prime of 0 are positive, then for n big enough, those guys will be positive too. So if you have synchrony, you also have a stable traveling wave if your ring is big enough. Now eventually, you can see that as m gets bigger and bigger, say m is n over 2, then this is looking like pi. <laughs> and we'll write down it here. So only a finite number of those waves are going to be stable. All right? And then that'll break down. So the low frequency waves, if synchrony is stable, the low frequency waves, the low spatial, the long waves, long waves will be stable, but short waves won't be. Okay? So you get this all for, you know, it's almost like getting it for nothing. Okay? All right. 20 minutes. All right. Let me do some chains. That's a ring. Let's do a chain, OK? Nearest neighbor guy, OK? Back to my Fortran numbering. OK? And I'll make it symmetric. So they oscillate. So this is a chain of n 
oscillators with slightly different frequencies. Okay? So what kinds of solutions can this have? Well, first of all, I want to point out, suppose, suppose h of 0 is not 0, all right? Suppose h of 0 is not 0, okay? So there's no reason to assume h of 0 is 0. Suppose all the omegas are equal. <laughs> Is synchrony a solution to this? So we've had n identical guys coupled, and they're all exactly the same, almost. Is synchrony a solution? Well, if it were, you'd have to have omega equals omega plus h of 0. Omega equals omega plus 2h of 0, right? Because there's two h's here. So that can't happen, right? So even if they're identical, <laughs> if h of 0 is not 0, synchrony is not a solution. And in fact, this is a really hard problem to solve in general with any, with even with omegas all the same, if h of 0 is not 0. There may not even be a solution, okay? A phase lock solution, or it may be really awful. So Nancy Capel and I, many years ago, proved a bunch of theorems about these chains when um, h of 0 is not 0, for example, and the limit is large n. And in the limit of large n, these things, you can reduce these to solutions to certain singularly perturbed boundary value problems. It's really cool. But I'm not going to talk about that. You guys can look up the, the papers if you want. Okay. So let's, let's try and, let's try and um, arrange things so that we can have like a traveling wave. Okay. So let me do this. Okay. So I'm going to give all the interior guys the same frequency and the exterior guys a slightly different frequency. Okay. And let's look for a solution of the form. I mean, let's, let's see if we can choose these guys so that we can make a traveling wave. What's a traveling wave mean? It means that theta j plus 1 minus theta j equals some constant, which I guess we can call kappa. Okay? Right? That would be a, traveling, a straight traveling wave. Do you see that? Each guy is just advanced from the other guy. You see that? That's a traveling wave. Okay? So let's, let's see if we can do that. Plug that in. We need omega equals omega 1 plus h of k. Omega equals little omega plus h of 2h of k. Oh, no. h of k plus h of minus k. Right? Omega equals omega n plus h of minus k. Right? So suppose, choose omega 1 equal h of minus k, and omega n 
equal h of k. <laughs> then you can see that that works. Because <laughs> everything, this is omega, this is h of minus k plus h of k. This is, um, oh, I'm sorry, plus omega, plus a little omega. I forgot the little omega, yeah, yeah. Now that'll work fine, right? And big omega is just little omega plus h of minus k plus h of k. Okay? And that'll give us a traveling wave. So what we've done here is we've taken a chain of identical oscillators and we've changed the frequency at this end and the frequency at that end to make this wave. And depending on whether k is positive or negative, the wave can go one way or the other. Right? So for example, if h is sine, okay, if h is sine, then um, if h is sine, then what you want to do is make this guy a little slower and they got, let's see, if, if h is sine, yeah, so one guy will become slower and the guy in the bottom will be faster and the other way around to get the other wave, okay? So chains are great, right? <clears throat> the trouble is, in, in general, you can't do anything with these analytically, okay? But still a lot easier than the full-blown um, set of Hodgkin Huxley type things. So you see, we can get waves for free on a ring, and in chains, we can arrange the endpoint conditions to get nice waves. Now, I want to give you one last, I, I, another example. Unfortunately, I, let me see if I have it in my notes, because I don't want to screw it up, because it's a bit of algebra, so I have to. Uh, Uh, I thought I had, um, oh, yeah, I don't actually give the answer here. Well, that sucks. Oh, wait, oh, I do, I do, I do, I do. There we go, yes, okay, good, so I'll do that. But before I go, remember the 2D stuff I was telling you about? I, I said it was kind of cool. All right, I just want to show you a picture, okay? This is a 20 by 20 guy, all right? And you can see there's this nice rotating weight. And this is for sine coupling. But if I do 20 by 20 with a little bit of cosine, it gives you a twist. And if you increase the cosine, this guy starts to meander around. It's really cool. You get this core instability. <laughs> um, I probably have a Python a program on here that will do that, so maybe I can show you that in a second. But anyway, let's do um, something that was started as one of the first things I did after my postdoc. This is really old, way before your parents were born even. Some of you, apparently. <laughs> okay, so so now this is this this came, this question came about from um, there was a, guy, a really famous mathematical biologist by the name of Arthur Winfrey. Okay, and he's like he was really world renowned for his work on oscillators. He's the one that first came up with the idea of like phase resetting and isochrones. He invented the concept of isochrones, things like that. So you can thank him for that. But he, he gave a series of lectures when I was a grad student in Utah. I wasn't a grad student in Utah, but I was, there was a conference in Utah. And he gave a series of lectures that consisted of a whole bunch of, it's like Hilbert's problems, okay? So he had, I think, 24 of them. And in my postdoc, I solved three of them. That was sort of one of the, <laughs> and, and I, I still work on these oscillator things. But one of them is really cool, okay? Um, you guys know what intestines are, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you rip out the intestines, 
of a person or whatever you want to rip out, okay? And you stretch them out, okay? The bowel, okay? And you stick an electrode in here, okay? What you see, and you record the frequency, what you see in the bowel is distance, frequency, you see these steps like this, okay? These are called frequency plateaus. Okay? Now, here's the fun part. If you cut the bow into little pieces like this, okay, and record the frequency in the isolated guys, there's this nice linear gradient, okay? So can you go from this to this by turning on coupling, okay? So our first paper was called Frequency Plateaus. Um, and it's where we actually um, developed the whole theory of weak coupling, okay? Generalized it to N oscillators. So I'm gonna do the following problem. Theta one dot equals omega Let us do sine because it's easier. Okay. Got that? It's just the thing. Now I'm going to do a little trick. I want to look for phase lock solutions. Now these guys are eventually going to have a linear gradient, okay? But instead, let me let, let psi 1 equal theta 2 minus theta 1. Psi 2 equal theta 3 minus theta 2. Psi n minus 1 equal theta n minus theta n minus 1, okay? So that's just the local differences, okay? Then, psi 1 dot equals omega 2 minus omega 1, okay? Let me call omega 2 minus omega 1 equal delta 1, and so on, okay? Omega n minus omega n minus 1 equal delta n minus 1, okay? Psi 1 dot equals delta 1 plus sine of theta 3 minus theta 2, okay? That is sine psi 2. This 2 sine psi 1, right? You see that? Psi 2 dot equals delta 2 plus sine psi 3 plus sine psi 1 minus 2 sine psi 2. Okay? Psi n minus 1 dot equals delta n minus 1 plus sine psi n minus 2 minus 2 sine psi n minus 1, okay? You to, if you don't believe me, just try it, <laughs> okay? Okay? So now, here's the really fun part, right? Let's suppose we find phase lock solutions to this. Phase lock solutions to this are psi 1 dot, psi 2 dot, and so on are zero, right? Because the phase difference of these has to be constant, right? We got rid of the omega, basically, by subtracting successive guys. Phase lock solutions satisfy this. 
Oh, erase the intestines. You're probably going to get them for lunch today anyway. <laughs> you guys are vegetarians. <laughs> the people that are not, that's what they feed us. <laughs> Bones and intestines. <laughs> okay, so minus... All I did for phase lock and set this to be zero, brought that over there, okay? What's really cool about this is that's just equal to minus two, one, zero, zero. One minus two, one, zero. Zero, one minus two times Oh well. Sine psi one, sine psi n minus one. Okay? That's just the stupid old diffusion matrix, right? And it's invertible because it has no zero eigenvalues. That follows from the gersh gorin circle theorem, okay? <laughs> or you can actually write down the inverse of this. So what do we get here? We have, we can immediately solve this by inverting this matrix and applying it to that. So let me call this matrix capital D. So what do we get? We get sine psi one, sine psi n minus one equals minus d inverse delta, where delta is the vector of phase differences. Okay. See, there's the minus and there's this delta. This is, okay. So as long as delta is really small, <laughs> then we'll be able to solve this because this will be less than one and greater than minus one in magnitude. Okay? We'll get to this in a second. But what's cool about this is this is going to be some vector of numbers a1 to an minus one, right? Right? And as long as each one of these guys is between minus one and one, we'll be able to solve this, right? But what's the solution to sine psi equals A? Arc sine, it, it's um, A sine of A and pi minus A sine of A, right? <laughs> Two different solutions. So. The number of phase lock solutions to this is 2 to the n minus 1, right? Because there's two roots for each of these, <laughs> and there's n minus 1 of them, so it's 2 to the n minus 1 roots, okay? Nancy Capel and I proved that only the principal one is stable, okay? That's the most important one, okay? So, I'll leave as an exercise to solve this when all the deltas are constant. And then you can show that if delta gets too big, if that constant gets too, in other words, if the frequency gradient gets too big, you can't find solutions. And so the bulk of what Nancy and I proved is what happens when that gradient gets past the region where there's phase locking we proved that there exists a frequency plateau. Anyway, so that's it. So what we'll do on Saturday is, I think we're done with oscillators. I'm gonna to start to talk about um, neuronal networks and firing rate models, and we'll talk some, a little bit about pattern formation and, and things like that, okay? All right.